Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. So we're here to talk about bioreactivity testing in single use system biomanufacturing. Uh, my name is Becky Tushingham and I'm a facilitator with Bioforum. Um, Bioforum is hosting today's webinar. So if you are new to Bioforum, if you don't know anything about us, our role is to bring together biomanufacturing industry leaders and subject matter experts to collaborate on issues and challenges. Um, we help to accelerate progress, to enable change and to really build solutions together. So that's a little bit about Bioforum. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, just to make sure that everyone enjoys today's webinar, and then I will hand over to our speakers for today. So, um, first of all, please do stay on mute if possible, uh, unless you're speaking, just so that we don't have any background noise. Um, please do actively participate. We really want to hear from you, um, and we have got some time for a Q&A session after the presentation today. Um, if you do have a question for our speakers, just raise a hand and we'll come to you after our final speaker has finished. Um, also, you can put questions in the chat and feel free to use the reaction buttons as well to let us know how you're feeling. Um, I'm joined today by my Bioforum colleague, Tim Corbidge, who is not on the screen at the moment, uh, but Tim's going to be monitoring the chat. Um, and if there are any questions we don't get to, um, we're going to make a note of those and we'll um, run those by the panel and come back to you after the webinar today. And at the end of the webinar, Tim's also going to post in the chat a very short anonymous poll, um, which we would really appreciate your responses to. So finally, just a reminder then that today's webinar is going to be recorded and a link will be shared afterwards for any colleagues who are not able to join today. So I'll shortly introduce our speakers. So um, if we could have just our speakers if, um, on camera while we're doing the presentation and then afterwards, everybody's obviously very welcome to, to come on camera. That would be absolutely brilliant. So who do we have with us today? Um, we're really fortunate to be joined by um, such an experienced panel and I'd just like to thank them in advance for giving their, their time um, and the, to share their knowledge and expertise today. So we have six speakers. We have Monica Cardona from Millipore Sigma. We have Shade Makuolu from Watson Marlow Fluid Technology Solutions. Ariana Gleisberg from Thermo Fisher Scientific. Kelsey Golk from Pfizer. Anderson Wong from Sanofi and James Hathcock from Cytiva. We're also joined by Nicole Hunter, also from Watson Marlow, who's going to be participating in today's Q&A session. So that's everything from me. I'm going to hand over now to Monica uh, to get us started with our presentation. Thank you. Very happy to be here today to talk about this topic that is dear and close to my heart. So. All of our organizations have sustainability programs and where this topic fits is really under social responsibility, bioethics, more towards that pillar. And it's really looking about how we are qualifying our materials for single use, right? Ensuring that we are being scientific, sustainable and socially responsible when we are doing uh, this material characterization. Specifically today, uh, we're talking about USP88 class six in vivo testing and moving towards in vitro cytotoxicity testing. Next slide, please. So what is our, our current state of affairs? Uh, clearly, those of us that have been in this industry know that single use um, has been introduced to every part of our processes. You know, initially, our single use materials were perhaps used for buffers and maybe non-critical applications. We know that over the last 20 years, that has changed significantly. We have single use filling systems, which as are as close to the patient as, as, as you can get. And it is important to define what testing is essential when introducing new single use materials. Um, we know that as a starting point, most of us use the Bioprocess Systems Alliance uh, quality test matrices that gives us a very um, good starting point on how 
quad to qualify our materials, what what testing and compendial standards to reference. And we have come to believe or perceive that USP 88 testing is a, a must have. Uh, as suppliers, we have traditionally always conducted USP 88 class six testing for single use material. Um, you know, this is maybe um, inherited from the filtration industry. So it's something that we've always done. Now, what are we encountering? Um, some testing labs are starting to decline requests for USP 88 class six testing. Not so much here in the United States, but there are several laboratories in Europe where um, we have been requested to provide additional documentation that would prove or support that the material that we're having tested is really required to be USP 88 class six test. So what type of documentation is that? So for a medical device, usually like for an implantable medical device, you would have a, a 510K. Um, in Europe, you would probably have some sort of an MDR. Clearly, um, we don't use single use materials for bioprocessing in, in that way. Therefore, that documentation is not something that we would have for our single use systems. And in some cases, we've been turned away from testing. What the labs have uh, clearly quoted is the 3R approach, right? To reduce, replace, and refine animal testing. And they've basically said, this test is not required from a regulatory perspective. You are doing this test because you want to or because you've traditionally done it, not because you're required to do so. And therefore we're declining testing uh, based on that the fact that it's not required and specifically against the laboratory's animal welfare policy. Next slide, please. So, no regulations exist that require us to perform USP88 class six testing for components in single use assemblies. This test has been performed uh, as a legacy test originally adopted from container closure uh, requirements. And again, uh, from the filtration industry as well. Um, filters don't require this, this type of qualification either. Um, some believe that the in vivo testing method is a bit more variable because it's qualitative and you're really observing uh, adverse reactions uh, and sensitivities to animal skin. And the purpose of this presentation and this panel here today um, is really to talk about and you know the steps that we're taking to perhaps move away from USP88 class six testing. Uh, we also have a stimulus article that will be released later this year, and we'll, we're looking to educate and and get consensus um, as to a way forward and to ensure that the testing that we do is proportionate to the risk that the material uh, will see. Next slide, please. So we know that we've always done this worst case testing. Um, it has been utilized for all polymeric materials, regardless of the risk type, and, and it has led to clearly excessive testing. We know that USP is currently uh, revising 87, 88, and 1031. And they're really looking at reducing the amount of redundant testing that is done on these types of plastic and elastomeric materials. Um, you know, refine the type of testing that we're doing so that it aligns with the potential risk. And ultimately, where possible, replacing in vivo testing with uh, available in vitro test methods. I'm gonna hand it over to um, Anderson Wong. Thank you, Monica. So how has the industry responded? Uh, next slide, please. In September 2021, BioForum conducted a survey to assess the use of USP 88 
and 87. The, US, uh, the single use supplier and end user respondents were from quality, regulatory, marketing, and technical positions. And among them, 83% said they would support a change in testing of single use components from 88 to 87. 96% of these respondents agreed that an industry statement on the validity of the switch would be useful. Next slide, please. And as a result, Bioform published a response in 2022 on the draft monographs related to chapters um, 88, 87, and 1031, emphasizing that USB 88 does not apply to plastics used in the manufacturing process. Furthermore, in 2021, the Bioprocess Systems Alliance Executive Board unanimously agreed to replace the animal testing with in vitro testing. During this meeting, BPSA emphasized that plastic components used in the manufacturing process of drug products and drug substances are not in scope of these biological reactivity chapters. And as a complement to this webinar, Bioform will soon be publishing an industry position paper too. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to James. Excellent. Thank you, Anderson. So when we think about single use materials qualification, we think there's a part that's the biological assessment, the part that's the chemical assessment, and the part that's really about the materials supply assessment and control. And as we think way back or going back 10 or more years ago, what we knew and what we got out of this chemical assessment was very rudimentary. Right? It told us general levels, but not specifically what compounds and so forth came from our materials. And because of that, we continued to rely very heavily on what historically was the approach in looking at the biological testing with the USB 87 align in vitro testing along with the animal testing. And it was a check the box approach and it worked for us. However, if we click, then we'll see more recently our methods around the chemical assessment have greatly evolved. Um, in terms of the methods, the analytical technologies for how you look at these extracts. And by the way, the, met the extraction methods are pretty much the same between the biological and the chemical, the way they're done here, to really determine what specifically the chemicals that migrate from the materials and the levels of those materials, those levels of those compounds. So you can do a proper pharmacologic tox assessment of those materials. And this really leads us to a position now where we're basing this on a first principles assessment of what's in that extraction fluid and what the safety of that is. And this is still continues to be coupled with an understanding of what are the materials being assessed, what do we look for in those materials, and how well does your supply chain control uh, the movement and processing of those materials. Okay. So specifically, when we talked about checking the box for the USB 87 or the in vitro testing, what do we mean when we've said we've done that or continue to say that? Well, it involves preparation of a monolayer or confluent layer of typically mammalian fiberglass in a petri dish. The sample preparation you do with your materials, typically if you're doing plastics such as single use plastics, it's the exact same as what's recommended in USB 88. That's where for like a film, you would do 120 square centimeters of fluid. 120 square centimeters of your film with 20 mils of your fluid it's where you get the six to one ratio that we all know and then once you have that extract fluid you do an exposure with either an auger diffusion test direct contact test with directly on the materials but typically what we all do is the solution test where you take that extract put 20 mils of it into a petri dish let it go for 24 hours in an incubator and then afterwards you look at the confluent layer of cells and look if there's any rounding or change in the shape of the cells or lysis of those cells to come up with a score. Next slide. Now, when we think about the in vivo biological reactivity testing that Monica described a little bit about, right? This comes from what was initially proposed back in the 1960s, has classes from one to six, with class six being the most rigorous. In fact, I think most of us don't really hear that much of class one, two, three, four, or five. The ISO standards specifically are aligned to 10993-6, 10, and 11 for the three specific tests that are part of this USP88 testing. And if we look for where the guidance is in these chapters for this in vivo testing, we typically look in USP to those chapters that are above the 1000 level, and that's 1031 in this case. 
And here, specifically, the title of the existing chapter is Biocompatibility of Materials to Use in Drug Containers, Medical Devices, or Implanted Materials, which neither, none of those are the cases associated with single-use systems, where it's really only transient contact with the pharmaceutical manufacturing process. Um, the specific tests, we mentioned there were specifically three, and those are the systemic injection test, the intercutaneous test, and that's with subdermal tissue or the implantation test. And again, we're not implanting these materials that we use for single use applications and so forth. And so those are the three specific tests we mentioned when we talk about in vivo biological reactivity testing. Okay. There's also comments within our team and within the surveys that have been previously done that Anderson described, where really we see very few 88 failures. And really, we believe this is due to the increased understanding of material compatibility and how we choose and select those materials today. Next slide. And here's a quick summary of the class one through six types testing that's taken directly from USP. And you see class six is the most rigorous of those types of testing that talks about which animals and tests and so forth could be used. But over on the right hand side, you see we went looking at specifically just for one test of a irradiated aseptic connector. And we look and say, what was really done? How many animals were sacrificed for this testing? And so for one test of an irradiated connector, we saw there were, I believe, 40 uh, mice sacrificed and 10 rabbits sacrificed for one condition. And then we look back, and if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see but that connector is also tested post autoclaving. So those tested were repeating there. We also look to say the resins, when we started developing a new single use component, we started with a resin that already had 88 testing data from the resin manufacturer. So that would give us confidence that we were investing our money. Again, you see the testing repeated. And you also know that we're not the only ones that use some of these plastics. They're used over and over by different um, component manufacturers across the industry. And this is where it really leads to a cascade in the amount of animal testing um, that's out there in the industry today. Okay. I'll now hand over the slides. Okay, thank you, James. Um, so this this next slide um, really outlines the historical context to the USP biological reactivity testing. The set of tests were first established in 1965, though some of the discussions with expert groups had started as early as 1960, when it was recognised that the use of polymeric materials in pharmaceuticals could impact patient health. It was established that plastics would be defined within a classification system on the basis of systemic injection, incutaneous and implantation testing. Further changes to the numbering of the chapter and clarification on whether an in vitro test could be considered as a decision point as to whether samples needed to be tested in animals were made in 1975 and 1988 respectively. In 1990, to complement the existing biological reactivity test in vivo, the USP added the biological reactivity test in vitro known as USP 87. USP intended the companion chapter, the biocompatibility of materials in drug containers, medical devices and implants, USP 1031, to provide guidance on the route of administration and the duration of exposure. What should be highlighted is that the USP had not defined how plastics which had transient contact with pharmaceuticals would be qualified. These chapters could be used to refer to plastics that had prolonged contact with drug products. Next slide, please. Hello? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so why are the USP moving away from animal testing for um, single use technologies? This is due to an acknowledgement that pharmaceutical manufacturing systems, that the plastics have no bodily contact and in most, con in most cases have only a transient contact with drug products. This slide details how from 2013 to 2025, there will be the introduction of subsequent USP chapters, which is intended to move the industry away from animal testing. 
with each modification of the plastic components and systems chapters, as, as you can see here, USP 661.3 moved to USP 665 in 2017, there's been a reduction in the level of testing required to confirm biological reactivity. In the idealized future state for the single use technology industry, there would be an initial reliance on the current USP 87 to determine biological safety. Then at a later date, there would be the potential to re introduce a revision, a further revision to USP 87 to confirm biological safety, depending on what the risk factors are. Already in USP 1031, there exists a risk assessment matrix, which addresses some of the factors to be considered. Ariana will be discussing this in the next slides. Thank you. Um, as Sade said, um, this is the risk matrix or the decision tree that is currently in place for USP 1031 that walks through the questions that need to be asked and answered as, as we assess what types of, of testing is required. Um, starting at the beginning there, the, the, the question regarding is the device in contact uh, in direct contact? If, if the answer is no, there's an immediate answer that um, that that the USP88 class six testing is not required. If the answer is yes, there's a number of subsequent um, questions that then walk through um, and help define and assess the risk related to how that material or that that product should then be tested. Um, as you can see, in most cases, um, it does end up coming back to a similar conclusion that through the, the various methods and um, assessments that are done, that biocompatibility requirements um, are met in different avenues. Next slide, please. Um, as far as the future revision of the bioreactivity chapters uh, 87, 88, and 1031, you can see the evolution here of, of the progress. Um, so currently with the the stated um, listing uh, for USP 88, the in vivo testing, removal of the impl implantation safety testing, specifically for the components that are not being implanted. Um, then moving on to um, USP 87, the in vitro testing, um, adding in the addition of cyt cytotoxicity tests, depending on once again the contact, um, addition of any general toxicity tests, depending on their specific use, and then for USP 1031, specifically removing the requirement for medical device and implants there. And I will now hand it off to Kelsey. So some potential roadblocks and concerns that the group identified starts with the perception that compliance to this USP class six for single use technology might be written into regulatory finding filings, and that's why we're doing it. Um, in ch speaking with regulators, we have not found that to be the case. Um, this compliance for class six is only required for drug product containers. So in not including it in the filings is not considered a major risk and FDA consults USP in these revision processes. So everybody's kind of keeping each other up to date. Another concern is that USP class six compliant SUT might be written into internal SOPs or buying specifications. So we would encourage end users to kind of work with their teams to remove that requirement from their internal SOPs. And in general, there's just a need to increase understanding of what this change means for end users, which is kind of what we're hoping to accomplish with both this webinar and the forthcoming paper. Our intention is phasing out the USP 88 testing, and it will be carefully managed by the suppliers with adequate change notification in order to disrupt, avoid any sort of disruptions in supply. So suppliers will continue to notify end users of any changes in testing and testing compliance. USP 88 Classics compliance, if it is already there, will still remain until there is any sort of material change. This suggestion is not going to impact any testing done previously, so everything will still be compliant. Everything will still be also very uh, to the same level of safety as it was before. So there's going to be no impact to patient or product safety, 
and no effect on previously conducted testing, only any testing going forward. Next slide, please. All right, and then implementation. For any new single-use components, we're going to recommend focusing on in vitro biological reactivity testing only. So we were not suggesting 88 in vivo testing for new components. Any existing components with current USP 88 claims, the existing data will continue to support these existing claims. They will not lose their current compliance to USP 88 class 6. However, any future material changes, we would recommend support from USP 87 or ISO 10993-5, both of which are that in vitro testing as opposed to the in vivo testing. We recommend that uh, suppliers still follow the Bioform change notification best practices, and we want to work to ensure end user internal alignment with this removal of the USP 88 requirement from any single use URS or procedures. We suggest that end users instead consider USP 87, USP 88, or ISO 10993-5 equivalent to satisfy any biological reactivity requirements going forward. And then our key takeaways. So in general, no single, there is not a single use regulatory requirement for USP 88 testing. So instead, we suggest utilizing in vitro USP 87 or ISO 10993-5 as an alternative to USP 88 going forward. So that way we can continue to maintain product quality and safety, but reduce the amount of animal testing going forward. And then moving forward, um, a USP 88 working group was established within Bioforum Sustainability. Activity started in March 2021 under SUS JLT. We currently have a paper in review by the wider team with 17 representatives, four supplier companies, seven end user companies. This paper is expected to be completed in Q4 of 2023, so look forward to that coming out shortly. <laughs>